Tu attends quelque chose, Michel Hein Tu attends quelque chose Ah bon, c'est d'abord que ça va se passer Non, non, c'est ici, mais c'est la présentation d'abord officielle. Et après, vous allez... Après, après, euh, avec les tout le monde. Ben, on arrête pour une minute pour que les, euh, les gens qui vont parler, ça soit ah ici. Ah bon, alors, ouais. d'accord, oui. on commence. Oui, oui, oui. Est-ce qu'on peut commencer Can we begin in this paper, I will uh, examine the manner in which Kiev became a capital city of the Soviet Ukraine. I will investigate the Soviet attempt in remaking this historical city into a capital of new socialist era. I will not be able to go into details of the large-scale destruction of historical monuments that ensued. I have attempted to do that elsewhere. I would instead like to concentrate on the manner in which the architectural and planning professions were coerced into providing blueprints for legitimizing the Communist Party's action. This coincides with other events of the time and suggests that in the immediate post-famine period of 1934, even the physical planning was part of an overall consistent policy of national repression. The character of the planning effort and subsequent redevelopment of Kyiv can be best illustrated by juxtaposing it with the developments of the 1920s. By way of comparison, let us look for a moment on the development of the first Soviet capital of Ukraine, Kharkiv. I am bringing this example for the following reasons. One, the architecture and planning professions in Soviet Ukraine in the 1920s were capable not only of planning and designing highly complex urban development, but also of establishing a long-range plan and implementing it. Two, it took almost 10 years to plan, design, and construct Kharkiv's capital center. Three, the resulting urban complex was built in a modern design idiom of the time, constructivism, that by its size and character was unique in the entire Soviet Union. The site chosen for the future administrative center of the capital was located outside the historical core and undeveloped area between the new and the old sections of the city. The proposed center was visualized as a plaza of gigantic scale surrounded by complex of major, major government buildings. The plan of the new plaza, now the Dzerzhinsky Plaza, consisted of a circular space of 300 meters in diameter, the southeastern side of which was abutted to the large rectangular space. Three major administrative buildings of Republican importance were to line the circular portion of the plaza. The House of Central Committee of the Communist Party of Ukraine, the House of the Government of Ukraine, SSSR, and Hotel were to surround the rectangular portion of the plaza. In 1925, an architectural competition was held for the first of the new structures, the Dershprom Building, or House of the State Industry. By the summer of 1933, the development of the capital center of Kharkiv was about finished. The last structure of the complex, that of the House of the Government, was under design. There were also other plans for capital. Among these, a favorite project of the Commissar of Education, Mikola Skripnik, was 4,000 seed Ukrainian State Theater. In 1930, an international competition for the theater's design was announced. Of the 144 entries, about 100 came from Western European countries, Japan, and USA. Among the outstanding design for the theater were those submitted by Walter Gropius, Marcel Breuer, and a Arthur Kessler. The winning design, the one you see on the slide, was designed by the well-known Moscow architects, the Vesnin brothers. In the spring of 1933, planners of Dipromist, or Ukrainian State Institute for Planning Cities, were still working on Kharkiv. But in January of 1934, came formal announcement of the move of the capital to Kiev, and all this work was abruptly terminated. At the time, the architectural profession in Soviet Union was being organized into centrally controlled organization and Soviet architects were being instructed to take up neoclassicism. In fact, in December of 1933, a month before formal announcement of the move of the capital, the first plenary meeting of their organizational bureau of the Union of Soviet Architects of Ukraine was convened. A report of this meeting published in an architectural journal, Socialistichny Kyiv, provides us with the idea of official attitudes. One of the basic reasons for the meeting was, quote, to eradicate hostile influences in the Ukrainian architecture, to expose peculiarite remnants who are trying to lead the young Soviet architecture astray, to extinguish chauvinism, and to clear the path for Soviet architecture." Unquote. At that time, comrade Ivan Malo Zomo 
head of the Organizational Bureau, also identified past mistakes of Ukrainian architects. The old independent Ukrainian architecture organization was, quote, a promoter of constructivism, which had shed art form architecture. <coughs> there was a lack of revolutionary spirit among Ukrainian architects. In addition, nationalist tendencies were being developed, unquote. The latter accusation referred to the neo-Ukrainian Baroque style in architecture, and he singled out Dmitro Dyachenko and his followers as the bearers of this movement. On January 24, 1934, the 12th Congress of Communist Party of Ukraine and the Executive Committee of Ukrainian SSSR formally decided to transfer the capital of the Soviet Ukraine from Kharkiv to Kiev, quote, the natural, geographic, and historical center of the Ukraine. The decision to transfer the capital of Ukraine to Kiev made it necessary in the eyes of the state to give the city a form and character corresponding to the political doctrine of Soviet state. According to Architektura SSSR, quote, there emerged a need to reconstruct, unquote, the city. This phrase reappears in Soviet publications dealing with the redevelopment of Kiev over the next 40 years. Soviet planners saw Kiev as nothing but a disorderly pile of religious and mercantile buildings. Attractive topography was considered its only real asset. The splendid architectural heritage of historic city was completely ignored. New constructivist buildings were also condemned and architects were commissioned to modify their exterior. The recently 1928-30 completed Kiev railroad station was criticized in the January 35 issue of Socialistichny Kiev, quote, a combination of Ukrainian Baroque, the style of Ukrainian chauvinism, and disrobed constructivism gave the Kiev railroad station building the unattractive appearance which it still has, unquote. Before reviewing the 1934-36 redevelopment campaign, a sketch of the main features of Kiev seems in order. Situated on a hilly side on the western bank of Dnieper River, the contemporary city developed in the 19th century on the basis of three settlements, the medieval upper town, which is indicated here in the orange or yellow color, Podil on the, or the lower town on the banks of, uh, of the river, which is this area here, with the river being here, of course, and the Pechersky on the hills to the southeast, which is this area here, the, the, and Kristatek Avenue being right over here. A wooden ravine, later to be known as Kristatek Yar, separates the upper town from the hills along the Dnieper River. On these hills, now the Pechersky region of the city, is located the famous monastery of the Caves. The development of the capital center of Kiev had a totally different character from that of 1920s in Kharkiv. The moving force behind the campaign was Stalin's deputy in Ukraine, Pavel Posteshal. Not only did he and his colleagues determine the basic physical outlines of and the essential character of the planning effort of the mid-1930s, but they apparently dictated the specific ways in which it evolved. Officially, the implementation of redevelopment program was assigned to a special government commission chaired by Vsevolod Balitsky, then member of Politburo of the Communist Party of Ukraine and commissar of GPU of Ukrainian SSR. The review of all the redevelopment proposals and master plans of large cities of Soviet Ukraine, uh, of Soviet Union, had to be submitted and approved by Moscow, as is clear from the June 27, 1933 legislation of the USSR. Early in 1934, an archite the Architectural Planning Administration of Kiev City Council sponsored feasibility studies of potential location of the administrative center of the capital city. Five different sites were investigated by Ukrainian architects from Kiev and Kharkiv. A review of these sites provides us with information on the options then available to the Soviet government. These options are illustrated here by the numbers, uh, with number one being somewhere to the south. Site number one. Since the 18th century, the administrative center of the area had been located in the citadel of Pe the Pechersky. Following this tradition and taking advantage of the fact that the large areas of the Pechersky were undeveloped, a group of architects argued for locating the new administrative center in Pechersky. This location provided the opportunity for development of a complex similar in scale to the one being completed in Kharkiv. It also allowed for a successful integration of the new center with the street network of the entire city. Finally, located high above the Dnieper River, the Pechersky region was an extremely attractive site. The Pechersky site was studied by a team of architects, Mikhailo Kolostenko, Mikhailo Hrychina, Vasil Onashchenko. Site number two, Kreshchatik Avenue, the acknowledged center of the 20th century Kiev, offered another focus. 
proposals urge the development of the new administrative center capitalizing this major urban art artery. At its northern end, Khrushchev Avenue terminates in a large plaza, which also serves as a junction of the two main arteries, one leading to Podil District, the other to the Pecherske. A team of architects from Kiev Institute of Construction studied this site. Site number three. The sloping land between Khrushchev <coughs> Avenue and the Pecherske Hills has been known as the Lipki, formerly a high-income section of the town. It had no institutional and mercantile buildings. Only 49% of the land area was built up. Pavlo Aloshin and his associates located the new capital center in this area and proposed to develop it on the site of the 19th century parade grounds, which were located high above Dnieper River between the 18th century Tsar's palace, now known as Marinsky Palace, designed by Bartolomeo Francesco Rastrelli and the Proletarian Park. This site provided the same vista as the historical upper town, and there was no need to demolish any existing buildings. In addition, this location offered the possibility of incorporating the capital center with the existing late Baroque palace. Finally, Aloshin's proposal also reflected the fact that the Central Executive Committee of the Ukrainian SSSR was scheduled to be housed in the former Tsar's palace, and the entire structure was being renovated for that purpose. Site number four. In an attempt to preserve the medieval church of St. Michael of the Golden Domes, a team of designers under the leadership of Professor Vasil Krychevsky proposed an ingenious solution, a perspective sketch of which was published in the Ukrainian and Russian <coughs> journals in, uh, in December of 34. The scheme proposed the development of the new city artery, which would connect by viaduct the main street, Bodemirska, of the upper town with the rivers, riverside parks on the hills of the Pechersky region. On one end of the viaduct would be located the building of the Central Committee of the Communist Party, and on the other, the Council of the Commissar's Building. This slide shows a view from the Pecherski into the upper town with St. Michael's being located right over here. Thus, this proposal not only would have preserved St. Michael's church, but would have capitalized on the existence of the historic monastery and included it in the proposed complex. Finally, it would connect the two major regions of the city, which were located on separate hills. The fact that the proposal was published without plan or site analysis would indicate it was never seriously considered or developed. The memoirs of Nolden Akonechny, an eyewitness of the 1934 plenary meeting of the Kiev City Council, informs us of Postashev's displeasure at these attempts to preserve the landmark of the city. At the time, Postashev was furious and openly spoke of the need to raise from the face of earth once and for all the historic rubbish which by its existence fed the roots of Ukrainian bourgeois nationalism. <coughs> site number five. Even at this early stage of the site selection and planning work, a decision apparently had been made concerning the final location of the new state center. For three out of eight studies investigated the fifth site, locating the proposed capital center on the site of the medieval upper town, the territory of the monastery of St. Michael of the Golden Domes. Three teams of architects, that of Petro Yurchenko and of Yakov Steinberg, and a design team from the Construction Institute studied this area. This, despite the fact that, according to the Soviet history of Kiev, the upper town was, quote, the most densely built up, 77%, and constituted the best organized and the most densely populated section of the city, unquote. Despite upper town's unique historic character, by the beginning of April 34, Commissar Balitsky, chairman of the Special State Commission for the Reconstruction of the City of Kiev, approved a scheme developed by the Yurchenko team. Next. This is a view, a uh, bird's eye view from the Dnieper River looking into uh, the area uh, to the east with St. Sophia's complex being right over here. This is the belfry of St. Sophia and the mon uh, monastery of St. Michael's was located right somewhere here. <coughs> Yurchenko's scheme required the demolition of the 12th century Church of St. Basil, later known as uh, the Church of Three Saints, and the 12th century Church of St. Michael of the Golden Domes and its dependencies. The final site selected, the first of the three closed competitions for the design of the capital center was announced. Oh, and despite the fact that design had not yet been selected, preparations also commenced for the demolition of the historic buildings. From June 8 to July 9th of 1934, the Church of St. Michael was officially reclassified as a Baroque building not meriting preservation by Movchenivsky and Goncharev of the recently purged and reorganized Institute of Archaeology, now the Institute of Material Culture. 
This court statement legitimized the demolition of the entire complex of St. Michael's. Subsequently, in line with the Soviet Ukraine's 1926 law of landmark preservation, the Commissar of Education, Zatonsky, was able to authorize the dismantlement of the historic landmark. Meanwhile, upon moving to Kiev, the Central Executive Committee of the Ukrainian SSSR occupied the rehabilitated Tsar's Palace in the Lipki region. The Council of the Commissars was located two blocks away, also in Lipki. Two days after the arrival of the government in Kiev, on June 26, 34, work on the removal of the mosaics and frescoes from the walls of St. Michael's began. This is a, uh, the Church of uh, St. Bezos, later known as uh, the Church of St. Uh, uh, the Three uh, Saints Church. And this is the Church of St. Michael's. In the fall of 1934, the first All-Union meeting of the Soviet architects was held. This was preparatory conference before the first Congress of the Union of Architects of USSR, <coughs> and its proceedings provide us with the idea of the concer concerns of Soviet architects of that time. Of the 55 attendees at this conference, only six delegates were sent from Ukraine, Aloshin, Kolostenko, Khaustov, Mashkov, Shafran, Mabotov. The th last three delegates were apparently included in the Ukrainian delegation not because of their professional standing, but because of their political trustworthiness. In light of the ongoing planning campaign for the monumental redevelopment of Kyiv, the attitude of the delegates from Ukraine is enlightening. Komostetsky from Leningrad proposed adding to the meeting's agenda a review of the preservation of historical landmarks. The only opposition to this suggestion came from delegate from Ukraine, Kovostenko. This lack of interest is quite disturbing since Kovostenko was very much involved in the planning of the new center in Kyiv, both as a designer and as a critic. Kovostenko's only active involvement in the discussion of the meeting concerned the new architecture of the collectivized villages. In the meantime, Leningrad's architects reported on their recently held regional conference. One third of that meeting had been devoted to the subject of relationship of the construction of to the architectural landmarks of Leningrad. In contrast, Kiev architects did not discuss their preservation effort in the December 33rd plenary meeting of the Kiev, nor in the November 34th meeting in Moscow. The November meeting was concluded with an agreement on the program of the forthcoming First Congress. The agreed upon agenda included review of the reconstruction of old cities, Kharkiv, Baku, Moscow, Leningrad. Again, Kiev was excluded from the discussion. On November 19, only a few days after the first meeting of the Union of Soviet Architects was adjourned, the architectural program of the state center of Kiev's upper town was approved. Subsequently, a second close competition for the design of the capital center in the upper town was held. While the upper town was the focus, of attention for this vast exercise in planning and demolition, it was in the Lipki that construction was actually taking place. Sometime in the fall of 1934, or maybe even earlier, apparently without competition or discussion in professional journals, Moscow's well-known architect Ivan Fomin was commissioned to design the largest structure built in Kiev in the 1930s, the NKVD building. It was sited on the edge of the same area previously proposed by Pavlo Oloshin for the new capital center. This poses question. Had the conscious decision already been made not to develop the capital center in the upper town, but in the Lipki? The results of the first competition for the capital center in the upper town were published in the Ukrainian Russian professional journals in December of 34. Notable by its absence was a discussion of the relationship of the proposed center to the historical townscape, for example, to the 11th century cathedral of St. Sophia or the 11th century church of St. Andrew. The proposed schemes were being designed and reviewed in vacuum. This particular scheme is by the brother, Vestin brothers from Moscow. And again, it's the same view that we saw before with St. Sophia's uh, complex being somewhere over there and not even illustrated. During the 1935, the planning campaign, though with many internal contradictions, proceeded to be finalized along the following lines. In April 1535, 10 teams of architects submitted their designs for the new capital center in Upper Town. As a result of the critique of the submitted entry, six teams were asked to develop their proposal further. At the same time, in the spring of 35, construction work began on the Lipke region on the 230,000 cubic meter building of the Commissariat of Interior, the NKVD building. In the spring of 35, demolition of St. Michael's commenced. Sometimes in the spring of, or summer of the adjoining Church of St. Basil was dismantled without serious archaeological investigation. As a result of the third competition for the capital center on the upper town, in the fall of 35, for the, which only four entries were submitted, three by architects from Moscow and one by architects from Leningrad, 
The design of the Leningrad architect Josef Langbart was selected by the State Commission for the further deliberation. By January of 36, Langbart design was approved for implementation. On the adjoining site during the spring of summer of that year, the stripped structure of St. Michael was blown up. Construction of the first of the two structures designed by Langbert, the Counts of Commissar Buildings, commenced in 36. The fact that it was a relatively small structure of 100,000 cubic meters and not like Kharkiv's Capital Center building or the NKVD building in Lepke reveals that there was no program of requirement for it. This slide shows uh, the new building being built here and the site of the St. Michael's uh, where the <coughs> second building was to be built and was never built. Sometime early in 1936, or in the beginning of 37, the closed competitions was held on the, for the design of the whole sessions of Supreme Soviet of Ukrainian Cesar. The selected site was again not in the upper town, but in Lipki, and the building was completed in 39. In the meantime, upon its completion in 38, the NKVD building, built in the style of Russian classicism, was designated as Council of Commissars building. This is the Supreme Soviet building. Both the Supreme Soviet building and the Council of Commissars building totally lacked the grandeur previously envisioned by the 1934-35 competition. On the basis of uh, the available information, one has to conclude that the 34 proclamation of the representative capital center of Soviet Ukraine in the upper town was motivated by considerations other than these of urban design alone. Despite expenditures of considerable amount of energy and resources for the development of the capital center in the upper town, a very undistinguished and unimposing center was finally developed in the Lipki area of Pechersky. From the architectural point of view, the latter cannot even be identified as a center. Somehow the idea of monumental ensemble of state buildings and gigantic plaza, such as the one developed for Kharkiv, was lost in the shuffle. However, in the process, the demolition of the upper town's landmarks served as a precedent for the destruction of historic structures throughout the city in Podil or in the, lo or the lower town, Pechersky and the surrounding area. This is the final center as it was developed with the Tsar's palace right over here, the Morinsky palace. This is the site which was proposed by Aloshin, the former parade grounds. This is the initial building of uh, uh, commissar, uh, NKVD commissariat, and uh, finally designated as the uh, Council of Com uh, Commissars, or now the Council of Ministers. And this is the site of about two miles away of St. Basil's Church, which is uh, had, was used for development of the uh, building, which was never used or very shortly used. The building was commenced. Uh, as a council of commissars, but it was eventually used by the committee, central committee, and now is the regional uh, organization of Kiev region. And right over here is a vacant site of St. Michael. This is just one of the sites of the belfries <coughs> under demolition, and in this case, it's the belfry of uh, St. Nicholas uh, Monastery in Pechersky. Thank you very much. Thank you, the Soviets in 1930s perceived the Baroque buildings as a uh, uh, one that uh, potentially represented the, the national spirit of, uh, uh, of the Ukrainian nationalists. And that, uh, yes, they did destroy not only uh, uh, St. Michael and uh, St. Nicholas and Pechersky, but also. Uh, a similar structure in Podil. And these were the two major uh, Baroque buildings uh, of the entire Ukraine. Uh, and the, both of them were uh, funded by Mazepa, by the way. Uh, Maybe the best example I can show, uh, the best example I can show of their attitude towards Baroque <coughs> is a uh, small uh, example. There was a church of St. Nicholas the uh, Dobry in Podir. It was a building uh, built in 1810 or so. And next to it was a <coughs> belfry uh, from 17th century. Now, the belfry happens to be built by Russian uh, builders. Uh, and it was relatively unimportant structure. <coughs> uh, and yet, in uh, 1934 or 35, uh, the church was demolished the belfry was retained for no purposes. It really sticks out 
uh, on the corner of the street, and if there were any reasonable planning uh, um, requirement, it would not make any sense to retain the belter. Yet the belter was retained. There was a certain amount of respect to it, uh, uh, to, to because of the master that built it. Uh, the Baroque buildings were not even discussed uh, as a worthy preservation. During the 1936, uh, when uh, all these buildings, uh, in particular St. Michael, was being demolished, uh, there is a major article, in, several major articles in Soviet architectural press discussing the beauty and the worthiness of the renovation. And in fact, the renovation took place of St. Andrew, which is a uh, um, which was built by Bartomeu um, uh, Rastrelli, and which is considered as a uh, uh, Russian. Uh, he is considered a Russian architect. Uh, so this uh, inaccuracy is, is there all the time. Thank you. You can accept only one question, more, please. Yes, um, I think an important point has been made here, and that is that. Famine, the uh, starvation in the countryside, is part of a much larger context. Um, the point of this whole panel has been that the famine, uh, the destruction of visible architectural uh, monuments of the Ukrainian past, uh, the destruction of writers, of society, and of the Ukrainian church are all part of a single process. And um, last summer, I was very fortunate to be able to attend the International Conference on uh, the Holocaust and, Ge and Genocide in Tel Aviv. And the types of problems we've been raising here are very similar to what people who study the Jewish Holocaust and the Armenian massacres, the Armenian Genocide, <coughs> have been dealing with. What they have realized is that there can be no one single treatment, no one single book. Uh, on a genocide. It requires the uh, cooperation of many different scholars, the bringing together of many different facets. Now, um, one thing that we lack is someone to talk about the psychological trauma, um, the so-called survivor's syndrome, which victims of uh, the Holocaust of uh, the Armenian massacres and of the famine have all gone through. The scars that they bear, the scars that their children and their families bear, in a sense, um, a scar on the Ukrainian nation and community as such. And I think that one of the most valuable things about this conference is the attempt to bring together as many of these different strands as we possibly can. Yes. Presenting a professor for Turkey you could comment on the role of other <coughs> religious groups, other churches in Ukraine during the same period. The process which began in 1929, which has been uh, uh, called by some the Stalin's second revolution from above, uh, has eventually affected all religions all religious organizations in Ukraine. And the sequence uh, was uh, connected perhaps uh, with certain priorities that the regime pursued in Ukraine. And uh, the nationality question had higher priority than uh, a religious question. And uh, where the two met was the Ukrainian autocephalous church. In other words, the, the first victim in the process was uh, the Ukrainian church, which was in fact a minority church in terms of the number of parishes, the largest um, organization being uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, headed by then by uh, local tenants, Metropolitan Sergei. In addition, uh, there was the so-called renovationist, Novenskaya Tserkov, church in Ukraine, which was progressive so-called, which has been at one time actively supported by the regime. They were all swept away in uh, the 1930s, as was the Roman Catholic Church, of which not a single one survived, as were all the synagogues, which were all closed, 
as well all the sectarian congregations which were disbanded with uh, the only surviving um, religious communities, as I have suggested, probably no more than 12 in the entire Ukraine, being loosely associated with moribund Moscow Patriarchate. Out of 14,000 churches, Orthodox churches, that existed in Ukraine before the revolution, 10 to 12 were opened within the old borders by June, they remain open by June 41. It is also worth noting in uh, the process that uh, the design, of course, went beyond the uh, destruction of the church organizations. Uh, the, the attack eventually turned against religious structures as integrating institutions, particularly in the countryside. Really, the churches, the parishes in much of Ukraine, present Ukraine, were the only integrating structures. And the destruction of this, the suppression of parish life, uh, served, so to speak, to pulverize society, to prepare the, the way for totalitarian reshaping of society, for there was, there was no meeting place anymore, there was no function of the priest has been even taken over by any Soviet institution. And indeed, it had effect on great many areas of popular life, religious values, moral values, the way people related to each other. So uh, if I may, in a sense, suggest that there is some much closer connection between what has been said by others, especially Professor Yitzhayev, uh, the attack on the peasantry uh, was preceded and accompanied by attack on the integrating institutions, which happen to be in the countryside, religious institutions. I would like to, to comment on the broad range of topics that were discussed today. I think it's very important that one defines the context which a particular event makes uh, extremely uh, pronounced. And I think that that wide range was, uh, to me, really very refreshing. I would like to welcome the uh, contribution of uh, Ted Haverick, who, as an active planner, was uh, especially well qualified to speak about the destruction of churches, which were supposedly done in the name of good planning. And he demonstrated very well, I think, that it was not really the final plan that was realized, but plan that, that, that is piecemeal and uh, uh, in its wake uh, managed to destroy important monuments. King Titus is also um, highly qualified to speak on, on the topic of destruction because he has been the guest curator at the Ukrainian Museum in New York uh, for an exhibition called The Lost Architecture of Kiev, uh, which is a significant uh, exhibition and anyone who's present here who can arrange for his uh, showing anywhere else, I would suggest it may be really worthwhile to couple it with whatever conferences there are going to be held on the topic of family. Well, thanks to our panelists. Thanks for your attention. The next session will take place.